Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to welcome you to our round table where we are going to discuss the Czech, German and Dutch approach to the uh, war in Ukraine uh, after uh, the second year. We, uh, you know the format maybe if you attended a similar um, round table last year. It's more a brainstorming session. You are not going to be given lectures. Uh, there will be a small interactive part at the end. Uh, and we function in a tandem for, for, uh, way. It means we will have a Dutch speaking and then a Czech and a German speaking and then a Czech. And we have gathered here a community of journalists, experts, uh, academics, uh, people who are working uh, at the parliament. Um, and uh, we are going to get, give you a broad perspective as far as we, uh, we can. To, uh, about my person, I am Natalie Fogel. I'm a senior fellow at the um, uh, European, Center, uh, um, European Values Center for Security Policy. Uh, and I'm also a, a fellow at the Intermarium uh, Center uh, in Washington, uh, D.C., uh, which is affiliated to the Institute of World Politics. We have a big honor to have here someone opening our panel who is um, probably the best choice we could get in Prague. Um, the, His Excellency um, Dan Fredo Huysinkha, I trained. <laughs> um, and uh, I discovered, I was really pleased to see that he's also active on Twitter. So I invite you to follow him on Twitter. It's really interesting. Mm. Um, and um, he will have five minutes to make his case. And I will be reckless and impolite in that, that I won't tolerate that this becomes six minutes instead of five. Your Excellency, you have. Floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, I was here last year and we were around the table. Now it's a little bit bigger. Um, I've got five to six observations, remarks, and I will end with a pitch and all this within five minutes. Um, I, you know, the, the, the central, central thesis I, I interpreted it as what did the war do with us, EU members? Um, Basically, uh, basically all on the same page, but of course reacting in different ways. And one of the first observation was that um, yes, the war did confirm, I would say, well, the the warnings from Central Europe, who know Russia as best, who have been uh, occupied by Russia in an, uh, an earlier well, decades before. Um, but it also uh, exposed the uh, divisions within. Uh, Eastern Europe. So there's a West-East reaction, but there's also differences within the East itself. Um, we see a different reaction in the Baltics, in Poland, and in Czechia. Um, but if you go further south and east, uh, with of course Hungary being the most extreme, almost being a Russian, acting as a Russian ally. But in the other parts, the reaction is much less, well, I would say, um, explicit. Right? Much more, uh, much less supportive. Um, talking about Czechia, just like the Netherlands, I think. Well, Czechia was actually one of the first to react to what was happening uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, very decisive. I think uh, all of us were pleasantly surprised by Prime Minister Fiala, uh, his very courageous trip to Kiev, together with Poland and uh, Slovenia, um, and uh, also the incredible speed. Uh, and I would say also the guts to start delivering heavy weaponry. Um, I remember getting that, that message in uh, March and we first didn't believe it, that the Czech Republic was so bold to send tanks. Um, but they did. Talking about my own country, um, we of course uh, uh, had the MH17 uh, disaster. So um, in our case, after the war, well, you would say it immediately flipped in the sense from trusting in the international legal order. Uh, and, you know, in MH17, all the court cases, of course, we, we had against Russia. Uh, but now this was a different game. So I think we 
uh, followed suit also with the, the, the delivery of heavy armaments. Um, actually, part of them bought in the Czech Republic uh, together with the US. We bought 45 uh, former Soviet tanks, and which were modernized in the Czech Republic and then shipped to Ukraine. Um, but also, um, I would say, disentangling our economy from the Russian ones. In that sense, we were uh, not as extreme as, as uh, Germany, but we believed in interdependence. Uh, and well, Shell's no longer Dutch, but uh, at the time, we certainly encouraged it to go uh, eastwards. Of course, we also had the ch energy charter by uh, one of our former prime minister lovers. And the idea was that, you know, Russia doesn't have that much to offer to the world economy, but it has its energy. We have the technology. There's a good exchange, and it will bind the Russian economy into the world economy. Um, well, that's been now resolutely pushed back, and we're part of that. I think there's also a, a parallel third observation um, that both our countries, Czechia and the Netherlands, were quite impatient um, with the Zeitenwende. We welcomed the Zeitenwende, but it took some time before the turn was made. Um, and I think there, uh, well, I'll go into the details. I mean, there are German uh, speakers here who probably have more to say about this. But there was a certain impatience. So when is really going to happen? And that was also linked to the arms delivery. Um, we don't, well, as I said, we had to buy tanks in, che in the Czech Republic. We used to have leopards, leopards, leopards. Uh, we sold them to Finland, so we couldn't deliver them ourselves. So uh, logical to look to the uh, Germany to do more there. Um, and there was a difference in, I noticed here as, as a, well, ambassador, observer, that the impatience in uh, Czechia was a bit more pronounced, uh, also not always nuanced. Um, and then I come to my fourth uh, observation. I generally notice the difference between our policies towards our big eastern neighbor and, well, Czechia happens to be on the other side, Czechia's policy towards Germany. I think we made uh, our own Wende uh, in the 90s after, uh, well, we have a tradition, you know, looking at the Atlantic, being pro very pro-British. We also got the Brits, uh, to our regret, into the EU. Um, well, nuancing this one, but uh, it didn't well, it didn't end well, let's, let's, go, let's, let's um, be honest about that. But no, um, uh, they were um, an important ally and frankly we were, as the saying goes, a bit with our back towards the continent. We, tried to, we were neutral in the First World War, we tried to stay neutral in the Second World War, failed in that regard, we became part of the Euro-Atlantic structures, but still a little bit hesitantly. And we changed that in the 90s. As we had a, at that time a, a, a foreign minister who said, you know, we have to crawl. It's a bit plastic, but we have to crawl in the German Franco uh, uh, armpit. So we're, since then, we are in the French German armpit. Um, and uh, it works for us. And I noticed it's one, one thing, as, again, as a personal observation, certainly as an ambassador, Czechia hasn't made that turn yet. Um, certainly on the previous government, it was looking to the V4. Um, well, in our view, not very productive, uh, obstructing a lot, but never being, a, 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 or not, well, seldom being a constructive partner in the EU. Um, and I think this, under this government, there's a good prospect for changing that. Um, there's, a, there's more interaction, etc. but there could be even more. Um, and that's my, my sixth observation. I mean, there's a clear interest of Czechia to do more. And let me com explain this. I mean, the the, the, the vendor for Germany is not, not um, how to say, it doesn't come without costs. I mean, the war with the German uh, industry, uh, creating higher costs, higher cost of energy. There's a shortage of cheap labor, or actually cheap labor in Central Europe, Eastern Europe is drying up. Uh, uh, more expensive natural resources, etc. And as the saying goes in the Netherlands, you know, when uh, Germany sneezes, we catch a cold. Our economy is, just like the Czech economy, extremely dependent on the German economy. So um, we have to do this together. We have to, it sounds a little bit uh, almost obnoxious, but we have to help Germany make that turn and turn it into a success. And I think there, the Czech Republic could do a little bit more, become closer, um, warm up to, uh, to Germany a little bit more. I know it's happening on the regional uh, level, um, but could also happen more uh, at a national level. Um, and one way to do this is also to become a more interesting European partner. 
I know the on Euro 7 and combustion engines, suddenly they were an interesting partner. This is the part we didn't like. But there are also many other files in, in Brussels where uh, we would like to see a, a more forthcoming uh, Czech partner, a more engaging Czech partner, uh, which, which actually it is becoming. I mean, it, it is in the process. It could do more. And last but not least, if you look at the, you know, the partners for, for Germany in Central Europe, um, well, Poland is a bit of a, a difficult one for Germany. Uh, that's usually, uh, uh, well, now there's, a, again, talk about renewed Biedergutmachung uh, with, with some financial claims on the table. Uh, well, I just mentioned Hungary as well. Yes. I'm Round the only up. German at the yeah. table. <laughs> Slovakia, we don't know, but you know, Czech, uh, the Czech Republic is very much the reasonable guy in Central Europe. So a very attractive partner. So I, and that's where I end. That's my pitch. You know, warm up to Germany. It uh, will uh, pay off. Thank you. It paid off for us. It will pay off for the Czech Republic. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy that you opened this panel because you touched upon all issues. Mm -hmm. So now I would like to zoom out and give uh, a broader EU perspective. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Julia Soldatiuk. Um, do you care to give us, like in two sentences, uh, a bit of your bio um, and tell us who you are? You're working with Klingendale. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave the floor for you. Um, further explanation to you. And you have five minutes, not six. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for uh, inviting me here. It's a, a pleasure and honor to be here. Um, so I'm a research fellow at the Klingendal Institute for the International Relations in the Hague in the Netherlands. And my research focuses on uh, uh, Ukraine, political security, and economic developments um, in and around Eastern Europe and um, EU policy, external policy towards uh, Eastern partnership. In two words. And um, I, I believe the question was um, that, 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 that I was supposed to uh, reply to, or maybe to, to um, elaborate on whether there is a consensus within yes, the- Yes, or, or challenges, and uh, um, yes, your take on this, your personal take on this. Right, so the, where this consensus among the European uh, partners on, uh, on the Ukraine question? Um, well, to start with, uh, the, the shift that has been that we've seen uh, last year is, is uh, starting. The gap is starting to close, by, and we see that uh, there is much, uh, there, there's um, quite important changes in, in uh, um, uh, the, the speeches of uh, the, the Council Schulz and um, uh, France and, and Germany is coming closer to the Michigan Four Four in, in, in terms of general uh, picture on um, an opinion on whether. Um, Ukraine uh, membership status in the EU. Um, so there is certainly a general consensus on a, on a Brussels political level. But then um, what, what makes it uh, challenging that this is something we discussed uh, before in a panel today is a, a clash with the national interests. Um, and that what, uh, where, where the um, message, or, or at least the national interest in each country will make it quite uh, difficult is, uh, for, for um, uh, to, to reach a unified um, unified approach for um, uh, welcoming or at least a, um, Ukraine accession uh, to it uh, the other um, the other aspect I wanted to mention um, is that um, there is um, um, the perception within the uh, um, European Union, um, th there is a difference between uh, countries that are really pro-European and it's uh, more uh, in, in Central Europe and Eastern Europe, and the countries with uh, um, that are Euroskeptics uh, and, and uh, Euroskeptics. Um, and what the situation in Ukraine also showed us within the European Union is that um, there is uh, a need for a, a stronger uh, European story and, and sort of myth um, and, and um, shared European uh, identity. So it, it, it has become, as a union, uh, too much of a technocratic uh, set of rules. And um, sometimes, um, especially we, we notice this uh, well in, in countries like in the Netherlands, we miss um, this, this support and, and this spirit of what we stand for as, as who we are as the European Union. And um, that this message has been highlighted by 
uh, contrast that we see in Ukraine uh, when managing how far there's so much uh, pro-like pro uh, value in, in fighting, in fact, for um, European values that are, have become for us uh, something of uh, right, um, obvious. Thank you very much. You were I don't know if you swallowed a uh, chronometer because you were <laughs> <laughs> you were on time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, let us move um, to uh, our Czech uh, colleague uh, Susanna, um, who um, who has uh, quite a, 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 an interesting question to answer, namely. It has been addressed by uh, His Excellency the Ambassador to the, ne uh, to, uh, the Netherlands to, to the Czech Republic. Can we speak in the Czech Republic of a uh, wind of change? Has everything changed? Um, have we uh, now uh, a totally different political culture? Or is it just more lip service and nothing is really happening? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Susanna Lesso. I'm from the Charles University in Prague. Uh, the question was whether this wind of change is somehow connected with the election of uh, Petr Pavel uh, to the presidential position. And I have to admit that this is a really powerful story, a story about the victory uh, of democracy over populism. Uh, the question is in which part of the story we are right now. And I wouldn't say this is something like a happy end. Uh, this is maybe some kind of a promising beginning, uh, maybe uh, an important partial victory. Uh, that means that uh, we can observe that there is uh, some change in the political culture, uh, which comes uh, top down. Uh, we can see that the president is, is active, which is really a difference uh, mm -hmm. uh, if we compare it to the previous one. Uh, the second thing we can see is that uh, the president uh, travels to the regions that he cares about the general public and that uh, he also cares about social issues, which I think is really important in this time when we have to take care about the uh, social cohesion. And he is also a man who understands the security issues which uh, have been neglected in past years. Uh, so I think this combination makes it uh, different and uh, also this like really clear pro-Western, uh, pro-European compass of the new president uh, is in my opinion significant because we are missing this like really strong pro-European voice in the general public. So I think uh, it's a promising beginning. All right, can we, can we actually, uh, um, assume that this also can be extended to the to other members of the or to the government because the president is not a member of the government. So. Uh, yes and no, <laughs> uh, because like in my opinion, generally spoken, uh, also the uh, change uh, from the Babish government to the current one was a positive one because it, it's also a democratic government, uh, pro Western. Uh, pro-Atlantic, um, but it's also kind of weak and fragile government because it consists of five parties which are not the same opinion and never issued. Uh, so um, I hope uh, that the government uh, will make it to keep together and to see like the bigger goal uh, and not to uh, have the disputes and the controversies among each other. And can we speak of a broad support for this um, change? Because it's not, it's a kind of sight and wind as well. Um, uh, depends what the opinion polls tell us is that uh, uh, Czech society is divided, not only in two groups, uh, mm -hmm. let's say pro-European or uh, mm, uh, Eurosceptic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, more complex, there are more groups, uh, some uh, people are just uh, Many are just struggling with the daily life. Uh, we know it. We have a like economic crisis, and uh, there's not not much space to think about other issues. Uh, and I think this is also genuine um, part of the work of the government that they have mm -hmm. to communicate. And uh, I would be rather critical there that uh, they haven't managed that well until now. All right. Well, thank you very much for this. Uh 
for this take on the current Czech situation. Now let's zoom in Germany. We have a specialist uh, of international affairs, Ulrich Speck, whom, by the way, also tweets, and I invite you to follow his tweets uh, to really know what's the deal and what is going on in Germany. Uh, Ulrich, do you care to tell me if this Zeitenwende is really happening? And if it is happening, let's assume the, uh, the current uh, regime of the Kremlin falls apart. What is to expect from Germany? Five minutes, I know it's yeah, tough. I would like to uh, use um, the, the promising beginning a line from Susanna <laughs> and also the line from the ambassador um, that Germany needs help. <laughs> Um, I mean, if we look at Seitenwende, there is the element, and there is change. But this change has been driven by Russia's war against Ukraine, rather than by a reckoning of Germany that over-dependence on Russian gas is unhealthy. Um, it took a pretty long time until this uh, happened, and it was not the Germans who were pushing for um, energy sanctions on Russia. It was the Russians who, who have cut this relationship. Unfortunately, I would have preferred the, the other way around, use it as leverage, but uh, Chancellor Scholz was too much concerned about the domestic uh, situation. And he thought it's helpful if the Russians uh, cut it so that he, he cannot be blamed for high energy prices. So yes, uh, it's, it's happening uh, in, on Russia. It's certainly happening. I was just to look at the new German security strategy, which came out today at 11. And, uh, it's very long, um, 83 uh, pages, and, and you find everything you want uh, in it. Um, but it's not very strategic, um, at least that's what was my reading. There are no clear priorities, but I mean, the Russia part is pretty clear. Uh, for the time being, Russia is the biggest threat to European security. And I think the Zelensky visit in Germany a few weeks ago has really confirmed um, that uh, Germany is now pretty much on Ukraine's side. I think this is, this is genuine also because there are many Ukrainians in Germany. And so this, this is kind of, it's, this is set. Um, on a, if, you, if you think that Zeitenwende should be more, I think on, on, on the military side, certainly to present NATO goals the Bundeswehr, this is going slowly, but I think Scholz is basically committed. He has to push this through, and we have with Pistorius, we have uh, you know, a very popular uh, new German defense minister who says always the right things. The Indo Pacific and talks about, uh, he just recently said that we, we were too much focused on economic relations and we didn't. You know, take geopolitics into account. So, so this is there's a promising uh, part of that. Um, if we think Zeitenwende should be a, a new definition of the German role in the world, um, I don't see much of it. Um, mm -hmm. And I, see, I think Scholz is not, certainly not applying the lessons from Russia to China. So he's. Uh, separating those two things. So it doesn't mean that there's a paradigm change in the German approach to the world. It's separate. It's, it's focused rather on European security, Russia. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing is, of course, a US-led. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and if the Biden administration would not be as, you know, I think, competent and, and, and uh, interested in, in, in supporting Ukraine, um, the whole situation in, in Europe would be, and in Germany would be different. But, Thanks to the U.S. lead, it was just possible to uh, get into this and, and like mm -hmm. France, Germany, uh, Britain. So, so this is not, Titanman is not so much domestically driven, mm -hmm. but it's due to the fact that the Russian attack has shocked people in, in Germany morally. I would still hope to, you know, to see more of an interest-based discourse on Ukraine so that it's not just a charity values driven yeah also because you know they, they if we give i don't know from, from 200 tanks if we give five or ten or mm -hmm. twelve it's like charity it's like well poor ukraine's need our help but it's not it's not our war. we are not really in this because mm -hmm. it's not our security and i think this is a misunderstanding i think the ukrainians do a great service 
uh, to our, our security. And so I think on the, the side of the yes, um, the, it's, it's a mixed bag that is good and, and, and bad. And to come to the, um, we need help, part of it. I, 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 when I'm in Poland or the Baltic countries, I always try to encourage people to team up and to lobby in Berlin, because this is what everybody is doing. I mean, Russia was very successful in lobbying in Berlin. China is quite successful. Mm -hmm. So everybody comes to Berlin and says, we want this, we want that from you. And, and the, 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 the several European countries have the, you know, someone said this morning, if Czech, Czechia and Slovakia would be still one country, um, they would be more powerful, and it's kind of true for, for the whole region where there are many small countries who feel powerless in, in Berlin. But so to find formats and ways to go to Berlin collectively, I'm sure has received the three, um, visited Lithuania recently, the three uh, Baltic heads of state government. So this kind of action, collective action, lobby in Berlin, this is very promising because Germany is an open country. Everything is being is on the table, is discussed. There's no clear uh, view of uh, um, mm -hmm. France when mm -hmm. you have a president who, who knows everything. Um, Germany has brought um, more, more questions now about the future. Claims to know everything. Thank you. <laughs> that was my French, because I'm French born, actually. So that was my French born. Um, Thank you, Ulrich. And for the rest, again, follow Ulrich Speck on Twitter. You won't regret it. Let me move to our friend Tomasz uh, Lindner from uh, Respect magazine um, to have uh, to have a view on, on on this specific question of Germany and the Czech Republic being on the same page politically. And uh, maybe he will be able to uh, discuss also uh, uh, the aspect of, uh, let's call this, um, not discord, but the points that where we would say that, for instance, in terms of uh, deliveries of weapons, we have different perspectives um, of the actors involved. Um, Thomas is a specialist of uh, German speaking or German, the German uh, language. Uh, area and so he he knows what he's talking about and there again for the czech speakers do do follow him uh, you will learn a lot thank you for that introduction good afternoon um i mean when when talking about um uh arms and weapons i think it's important to note that czechs and germans share 20 or 30 years of common underinvestment into defense. And I would say the German underinvestment into defense is more of a consequence, more of a consequence because of the weight of Germany in European and international politics. But in my opinion, it is much more understandable uh, than the Czech underinvestment into defense. Because simply because of our history, because of um, our yeah, history in the first place, um, we should have been even more cautious. And I'm doing this because I feel, I, I have felt um, a lot of schadenfreude uh, and um, lecturing of Germany in the, Germ in the Czech public debate on Germany in the past years. That it seemed to me that lots of voices uh, acted as if we did everything better, we knew everything better the Germans when it came to security, defense, Russia, Ukraine. Um, so that's one point that I wanted to mention. At the same time, I feel that uh, the politicians, or important political actors from the, from the governing parties, from the ministries, they didn't make such cheap points in uh, cheaply criticizing openly, uh, publicly criticizing uh, Germany as, for example, Polish politicians did. Because I think lots of the Polish open criticism of Germany is, yeah, some, quite often they arise in specific points, but I think sometimes the rhetoric and the, the causes of why they, they say it 
is driven by domestic politics, uh, mobilization of the anti-German sentiment in the domestic campaigns. And the Czechs didn't do that, and I think uh, this government didn't do it. And I think this is good. This is a good basis of also reason for this huge relationship on strategic dialogue towards not only Russia, but also debate on China that's right now. Uh, that it can be founded on some mutual respect or trust, you know, which would be the best word. So that's the second point that I, that I wanted to make. Another point that I that I thought was um, uh, important is that when we talk about weapon deliveries uh, now to Russia, I don't think uh, no. at least and Russia to Ukraine to fight Russia. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I don't think, uh, at least um, from what I heard from people who know more about this issue than, than I do, and I don't think there's such a there is such a difference. I think there the two countries are also now on the same page, on a similar similar page. And there was a lot of criticism, like not only in the Czech Republic but in many countries, among the, also the experts, um, criticizing the, the, the most speed of German decisions to make weapon deliveries. But I believe that um, that German low speed has its causes in lots of things and also and one of those things is the consensual character of German politics that um, that for years was basically um, that was that is distributing power among lots of uh, institutions or actors and doesn't have like this one strong central voice who says this is how it's going to be and I believe this uh, character of German political culture has a a disadvantage, the slow, the slow speed, but it also has an advantage where I believe that uh, those decisions uh, are uh, then pretty sustainable. That then, uh, when it comes to weapon deliveries, I believe there is a broad consensus now in German politics about that topic. And that even if uh, we would have next elections and the opposition would win and create a different coalition government, um, nothing would substantially change. Germany would be on track. And I would say in Czech Republic, in the Czech Republic, I'm not so sure what would happen uh, if the opposition uh, would win and create a different government. But also in France, I'm not sure what would happen if Macron would not win the election, someone else would win. And even in America, I'm not sure what would happen if uh, the opposition, so the Republicans, the Republican candidate would become president. What would happen? So I believe this German slowness, often criticized from experts in our Central European um, area, has also its advantages. And Thank you very much. Um, I I would like to um, to address a new aspect of the problem. It is um, academia, and uh, we. Also here at EBC have been wondering about this uh, this site and vendor also in uh, areas such as NGOs or, or academia. Is there a need for a site and vendor in academia? Alina is a uh, is teaching sociology at the University of Göttingen. She is Ukrainian born, and uh, she's going to tell us what kind of challenges uh, she faces as a as an academic who is trying to. Um, literally work the floor in terms of uh, Ukraine studies. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for, for um, the invitation. It's, it's an honor to me, <laughs> for me to be here. And uh, so, uh, yes, um, I'm teaching sociology in uh, for, for, as a basic uh, knowledge um, for social scientists in, at the University of Göttingen. And uh, since um, the big war started, I was, I had, um, so um, my position wa was um, a little bit ambivalent. Um, on the one way, I received a lot of support, uh, especially um, especially from some colleagues, but uh, um, um, especially of uh, um, a dean of studies as social sciences. And uh, um, on the other hand, and so I started to um, to do a research with uh, our students. Uh, 
on uh, discourses about Ukraine and German society. So I am, we are doing this uh, um, yeah, for, for two semesters. Um, but on the other hand, um, the, yeah, because I am originally from Ukraine, many colleagues are um, so um, are asking, uh, can we trust these results? Yeah, because uh, you are a scientist, uh, you, sh you shouldn't be very pro-Ukrainian. So we, we have a difficult situation. It's very, it's very scientific uh, rhetoric, uh, so rhetoric issue. Uh, the situation is not clear. Uh, there are shades of gray, and uh, yeah, we have uh, we have um, a look at this uh, problem from the different different perspectives and different sides, and and so on and so on. And then you are not not sure what what you are doing now. Um, this is uh, one um, one point. I, I'm wanted to focus on the uh, second point um, so I, I was uh, I was wondering about a lack of knowledge about Ukraine at different in different sciences and different uh, departments and the people are asking the same question what is Ukrainian state what is Ukrainian national identity um, uh, is the Ukrainian worthy to be supported? What is Ukrainian language? Is it the dialogue from uh, the Russian language? And so on and so on. It, it, it's, it's a repeating situation. So uh, we, are, uh, we, are, uh, we do research about discourses, um, but then I started to read uh, some old, new, uh, old books uh, from, uh, um, uh, from uh, um, historical scientists, uh, Eastern uh, Europe historical scientists, and I saw they uh, wrote this uh, 30 years ago, so it's not new. But every um, decade they started to ask the same question. And then it's uh, why, why my, my thesis is, uh, um, yeah, we, we, we don't have uh, this site in Bend. Uh, we are repeating the same stereotypes and uh, we ask the same question. Why is it, what is the problem? So, and um, when we, um, the third point, when we are looking at uh, Ukrainian studies in uh, Germany, um, so uh, they, uh, they remain uh, very um, marginalized. We have one and a half professorship position in the whole German, German country. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> um, first one was established in 2018. Um, it is a 50% of position uh, for, for the historian Andriy Vodnok at the University of Frankfurt uh, and at Oda, uh, and general history in Ukraine, 50%. And the, one, uh, the next one was started in 2017. Um, it's a um, professorship on Ukrainian cultural studies with uh, Roman Dubasevich, and it's all. Yeah, but uh, there are some some projects and networks in different institutions and departments at seven uni uh, seven university in, in Germany. But uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, these studies are very um, yeah, it's very minor studies, so very exotic studies. And uh, yeah, my, my question is, what should what can we do to change the structure? The structures are very very um, uh, yeah, stereotyping stereotyping and very um, st um, stable stable for uh, especially Sla Slavic departments. Um, we have um, already at, uh, in, in every German university a department of Slavic studies. It's uh, philology and uh, language studies, and they are mainly focused on Russian uh, Russian um, research. Uh, also, the or Soviet Union. Soviet Union um, uh, looking at the same uh, Russian and Soviet Union is the same. And um, at, at the University of Göttingen, I don't see any changes. Uh, they have a bachelor study program, Russistic, and master study program, Russistic, and they didn't widen uh, these study mm -hmm. programs for Ukrainian or, or other country studies in Eastern Ukraine. It, it's the same. And um, so uh, um, last week I had a, a very interesting meeting with uh, Andrei Portnov on Zoom, and he's, he's, um, he said, um, yeah, uh, Russist, R Russian studies are waiting for a new Russia. Good Lord. Well, I think it's going to be exclusive. Your, uh, <laughs> I think you, you got the message across. I was actually wondering where this, uh, there are two phenomena in Germany. There are uh, uh, what I call Anum für nicht Spezialisten für alles. So uh, they, they don't know anything, but they are experts on everything. Uh, and I was wondering, where are the uh, Ukraine, real like, Ukraine experts? And here I have my answer. I had to wait two years. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Yes, if, uh, if universities do not uh, train these people, you're not going. You are going to have the expertise that you have. And we have, I think, uh, well, we can confirm this, we had at the beginning talk shows on Ukraine without Ukrainians. I think you, you, you remember that, yeah. Good. Um, without further ado, let's move on and uh, ask Maureen Stahn, who's working with the German parliament. So he is uh, with the FDP. Um, you see, you are doing the field work of, of site and uh, You see concretely uh, where the problems, if there are any problems, if, uh, if we are all mistaken with our criticism or with our um, positive assessments. Um, and uh, you can explain to us what, what's the, the meaning of site and for Central Eastern Europe. And what, what are, are the challenges, challenges for the coalition? The floor is yours, five minutes. Yeah, thank you very, thank much, you very much, much for being here and for inviting me. Um, basically, I remember the extraordinary session of the German Bundestag. I think it was three or four days after uh, Russia's full scale invasion of uh, Ukraine. And basically, um, I, I can say that the majority of the democratic, of the, of the member of the parliament, of the democratic uh, parliamentary groups were really shocked. I think whole Europe was shocked, but uh, the Central and Eastern European partners were shocked too, but they always warned, especially Germany and some Western uh, European countries, don't be too naive in your, in your approach towards Russia. And um, so I would like to say that I think we also need a Zeitenwende in this regard in our mindset and approach to Central and Eastern European states. Because Western European states, they didn't know what, what, what it means to, 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 be, uh, to have Russia, as, uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, or Russia as a neighbor, um, or to be under a, a direct influence of the Soviet Union with just limited sovereignty. Um, so um, having, having said that, um, um, no, I lost my point, give me a minute. Um, the expectations now towards Germany are, 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 are very high, and um, you could have seen it um, when uh, the president of the Czech Republic, Peter Pavel, visited uh, Germany at the middle, middle of March 2023. Um, because look, the first uh, country he visited was uh, Slovakia, then Poland, and then Germany. Uh, the election of the president for Germany was a relief. And, uh, but at the same time, the, the, the expectations are high. Because Central and Eastern European countries, they, they want Germany to lead. They want Germany to lead now, not to lose time. And um, um, that's exactly um, where the fate of Germany and the credibility to also be part of the leading engine in Europe will be decided in Central and Eastern Europe. I think, I, th I think this is, this is uh, a point we, 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 have to, we have to really focus on and we have to, to, to have this honest uh, debate about also the mistakes of the past in, it, in, in, in the approach towards uh, Central and Eastern United States. Um, regarding the bilateral relations between Germany and the Republic, I think the window of opportunity was there um, in 2021, when we had the change of the change of government in uh, Germany on one, hand, one side and the Czech Republic on the other side, you know Germany always had uh, difficulties with dealing with the former prime minister of uh, the Czech Republic. Um, um, now this has changed completely, and um, um, the, the momentum is, 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 is there. We can feel, we see it. There is a Czech um, interest in, uh, in, in the participation of the LNG terminal in, uh, in, uh, in Lumin, excuse me. Uh, plans um, basically to increase the connectivity between uh, both countries. Here I would like to refer to the railway line based in Prague. There is, there was, there was, I think, two weeks ago, there was the announcement that. A German railway company that um, basically wants to, to decrease the time, the travel time between Dresden and Prague. Um, then we have the plans also to extend the railway line from Munich Pilsen and Munich Prague 
So I think this goes in, in, the, in the right direction. At the ministerial level, there is also the chance is there for deepening uh, the cooperation in the framework also of the strategic dialogue between two countries. Um, of course, cultural exchanges, because let me say that uh, the chaotic management of the corona pandemic and the national reflexes can, is still somehow there, because we have seen uh, that mistrust was suddenly there. It was not possible to completely erase it. Suddenly, borders were there too. There was this, this degree of mistrust, and I think it's a pity, and I think, as I uh, mentioned, it is important to talk about mistakes of the past. Um, exactly. Um, so I think these, these, these steps and these uh, things can also strengthen up the resilience of both societies. Erasing differences, I think, is never possible. You will see divergent opinions regarding the future use of nuclear energy, if it's worth it to invest in small modular reactors or not. You see it in the field of uh, qualified majority voting in the council or unanimity. Um, so, yeah. That's, that's, well, that's basically I mean, it's, it's a kind of an optimistic thing. Mm -hmm. um, let's hope that, that you are right. Uh, let's, uh, let's concentrate on, on an upcoming event uh, that is going to be of uh, high relevance in the next weeks, um, the Vilnius Summit. Uh, and their voices have... Um, become louder that um, are insinuating that Germany could could have an aligned gang and uh, uh, that we, could, we are basically about to uh, experience a Bucharest reloaded. And so I, I thought, who else than, other than Teresa Winter could answer that question? Are we going to have a bad surprise? Please tell us no. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. I don't think it's going to be a general eingang. I do think, though, that we won't have what most of us probably expect or would want to see. In all honesty, so just for a very brief background, so I worked with the foundation, I come to the Defense for Germany. Um, an industry background, so I used to work a lot in for quite a few years. Um, and I look at all these things a little more pragmatically, if, if you will. Um, Vilnius Summit, to be honest, I've heard actually that question before, I think, on your panel. Um, what's going to happen? Is there going to be a unified response from NATO on how to deal with Ukraine? Um, are they going to be offered the member protection plan or something like that sort of? In all honesty, there has already been um, statements that the membership is not on the table as long as there is a war ongoing. And all the other discussions on, on any end state scenario, they're just they're not really happening, at least not and not not openly and not in a way that you could really say, okay, we just build scenarios and we say if this this or that happened then we can have. Also a, a just I don't know, you could have a plan that you just cut down a little bit and just adapt it to different scenarios. I don't in all honesty I don't see that. And I also see I don't know. We'll see if the Vilnius Summit will it will build on Madrid results, it will elaborate on what has changed, it will go into the details of how we all adapted to, to the deterrence a little bit more, that territorial defense, etc., is in the focus of most of the European armies. We will talk about uh, the current exercise air defender and how that turned out. I mean, there's, there's some examples for the specific Ukraine part. In, uh, I don't know, and I, but I don't see that uh, there's going to be that decision that they are probably expecting. But I wouldn't call it in any way a German alignment because Germany is in many things, if we already alluded to this, really looking to the US to make a lot of decisions, and there is a little bit of a, I you read something like a shadowing of mm -hmm. US positions. Bandwagoning. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what I probably expected. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have, because you also ask the cohesion, the alliance mm -hmm. on that. And you have the first line, uh, of course, have their own cohesion, and a very strong opinion. Um, we recently had Macron and Scholz uh, dine in, in Berlin, and then you see that they are obviously not on the same line, especially when it comes to security guarantees, and that's, that's a whole different topic. So we'll see about that. Um, 
Ulrich already mentioned the national security strategy, everybody else is going to read it probably today or the next days. This might be a bit disappointing, or maybe it is a fair point. Um, I wouldn't go into that now because it just goes down the wrong way. But I would like to mention that maybe it's something that we want to discuss. I don't know how much we open this also for interaction, but the book of resilience because it's part of the topic as well. Mm -hmm. And what we can actually do on a more pragmatic level. And that's actually uh, the German Dutch Corporation is a very good example I'd like to mention, distribute because there's the first German Netherlands Corps that's mm -hmm. located in Münster in Germany, mm -hmm. and they this is NATO subdivision, they've been dealing with common effort. So if we talk about the integrated approach, how military and civil co cooperation can work. For the past years they have looked at Sahel and a more international mm -hmm. crisis management perspective. And last year they adapted, of course, like everybody else and are focusing a little bit more on pillar one, on resilience, um, on the ter territorial defense aspect, but not to forget about all the rest. And they're doing what we're doing, and we're part of that, and an exercise of exercise type, strategy game, to look at what happens if critical infrastructure is And that's what I want to say is that there's, on a pragmatic level, corporations that are already existing since, since years, but are really moving up in speed, um, incorporating civil organizations such as ours, for example, mm -hmm. um, that have this training effect. And if you talk about how do we change mindset also in academia or general the public debate, um, this won't change that, to be honest. I mean, we're going to invite universities and see whether that kind of helps if you are part of a more interactive um, uh, game situation. Um, but, but that mindset, mindset aspect, I mean, you would have to go into the the scholarship, but, or, or at least in, in any type of curricula that you already have in school, so that people or students say, hey, you know, I want to, hey, sorry, um, go into that. That's a different topic. Um, so just to raise that, if you talk about resilience, maybe we can talk a little bit about more pragmatic effort, things that we can do, mm -hmm. go a bit away from the expectations of high-level diplomatic meetings and decisions that are so far more complex. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I knew I could rely on you for tackling this issue. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yes, let's zoom out uh, and answer the elephant in the room uh, when it comes to, to Russia. Uh, and the question is, uh, have we won the info war after all? We've been under attack for years, for many years. Uh, single countries have developed uh, strategies. Uh, have they been successful? Uh, did we deliver? Is the danger still there? And there is the expert with us. Nikolai Horais is going to give us an answer. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll keep my answer short because there's lack of air in the room. The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been a pleasure. No, um, <laughs> maybe two more minutes. Uh, we have won some battles recently. The situation is much better than after uh, Russia to Crimea. Uh, the public, I'll, I'll narrow it down to the sociological angle because that's my goal. So the public opinion uh, has improved in terms of how they understand Russia as a threat, they understand the issues of Ukraine dramatically. We haven't seen such shifts never in our you know, uh, long-term tracking and research we do on, on perception on foreign countries. Uh, so there are, there are very good news that this can change, that it has changed that most of European countries, in most of European countries, the population is understanding the threat of Russia and is uh, supporting Ukraine. There are bad news that there are many countries in Central and Eastern Europe and they, the population is uncertain or lost or disoriented or disinformed. Um, to some extent also the Czech Republic, but the picture is not that rosy. Uh, uh, but compared to the past, you know, we are improving. It's being better in, in the, when it comes to outcomes. I'm, I'm not sure if we are improving when it comes to measures, when it comes to political influence, when it comes to uh, business influence that fast as I would like to see that, but uh, let's again look at outcomes. So, uh, four or three or four points of warning uh, when it comes to you know winning battles but not winning the war. Uh, first, uh, the underlying uncertainties, the underlying you know um, 
reasons why we look at this way at Russia and Ukraine are still there. For example, many Central uh, and Eastern European countries, they dream this uh, false dream of neutrality, of being somewhere in the middle bridge, bridge between East and West, not having allies, not having friends or, or foes. And that's a bit dangerous, and that's still there. And for example, in the case of Czech Republic, Republic, it has a point. Uh, and if there's such, you know, if there's such uh, inertia face to face vis a vis such a big event, uh, you see that there's a uh, trouble. So that's one thing. Another thing is, the, you know, most of the European population is against Russia or, or fears Russia, but it's not for Ukraine that, for Ukraine that much. And that's not the same thing. If you look at the media or if you visit discussions such as ours, you would think that's connected, but it's not always connected in the, in the public mood. Again, uh, Czech Republic as an example. Uh, uh, most people are against Russia or want to defend against Russia, but you know, only 15 to 20 uh, percent uh, want to support Ukraine military. You know, sending weapons, etc. So there's a big gap between those two phenomena, and we have to be aware of it, and we have to be careful. Uh, also, these changes, you know, when they happen so fast, they are pretty shallow usually. So I'm sure that if the, for some reason, the war ended uh, now, uh, they, there will be many countries where the world would, would slowly or faster return back to what it was pre-war because uh, uh, usually uh, these changes are of a speed of glacier, uh, usually, or glaciers are not pretty fast because climate change. But let's say it's, um, it's a very, usually public changes it, uh, um, uh, won't be very slowly, and it takes a lot of time to have deep changes and not shallow ones. And last one, last thing. Uh, one success or one battle is doesn't mean we are winning war at other fronts. We are winning, We are not. We are not successful with uh, China in that matter, um, and and we are also pretty lucky in these recent battles because the disinformation campaigns they usually work on destroying or making you know uncertainty, distrust, uh, negative mood. So that's why it did not work in helping Russia, building positive image of Russia. So when there is a black and white fight, it's not that easy to use this information campaign. But when we get back to normal, whatever normal is, uh, it will be again successful and efficient. There's no, it's not losing its efficiency. It's effect overall the uh, the tools and uh, means we see. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, this concludes the round. I don't know if we have a few minutes left. We have five minutes. So very bright questions targeted at very bright speakers. Yes, your name? Uh, I'm Dini Dushek from SAP University. Uh, I have a quick question uh, that probably is for Mr. Speck uh, regarding what you what you mentioned. Also for the uh, for your remarks. Uh, thanks to all speakers for, for the input. Uh, regarding the, the German security strategy, uh, do you think uh, you just it's kind of true for as you put it. Uh, do you think that there is some learning curve taking in place? Do you see any learning curve taking place in the future vis a vis with China? Uh, considering what, what we experienced and what we are seeing, uh, that Germany uh, made the turn uh, as regards Russia, but still is kind of uh, iffy in terms of China. Uh, labeling in both uh, partners and also partners. And I think that that's something that we, we will all be dealing with. And I encourage all the other speakers also to be Thank you for your time. I think that in Europe generally there are three um, directions. One is Scholz, who really looks at it from a commercial standpoint. It's not a geopolitical standpoint. It's, it's just Germany's big, big business, and we think that in this situation where we already decoupled from Russia, we cannot decouple from China as well. And so this, and, and, and von der Leyen was kind enough to give all those people in London nice term be risking because it means business as usual. <laughs> and, 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 and the French agenda is more geopolitical, but more in the sense of defensive 
uh, not let China enter its own space. But what I don't see is an ambition to shape the environment in the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. So this is totally missing. But uh, von der Leyen is the one who is who has really, I mean, she's a former German defense minister. She has this security uh, dimension uh, very much on her screen. And so with Russia and China, she's trying to push, uh, push this agenda. And she also talked about China wants a different kind of world order. I mean, I mean, Scholz in, in the German security strategy right now is that he, they want to change the international order, but it's, it's, it's rather, you know, get into a better position in this order, not uh, not attack this order where von der Leyen is. So I think we have very competing approaches now. And, and in the German case, and I would also say in the French case, if the leader of the country travels to Beijing with a big uh, economic uh, business delegation, it just sends the signal that uh, whatever happens, uh, business is our main interest here. So, so we are not there, but of course, they're in the coalition, FDP and the Greens. Uh, the Greens want a human rights approach. The, the, the FDP is, is the most interesting party here, I think, because they they are openly, and Lindner, the, the, the head of the party, and he has been very badly received in the Beijing yeah, ones we after need, the, We need to make it quick. So, so there, there is change, but it could rather we just have one the next minute. government rather than, than this one, I would say. Lorin, one just minute. To, to add one thing, um, I guess the key word here is the risking, not decoupling anymore. And we see that the, 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 the German businesses, the companies, they are a bit more reluctant because they argue that this was, will result in the loss, loss of workplaces in Germany. And basically many MPs and also my MPs has uh, talks with uh, companies and they say, look, decoupling means loss of workplaces in the constituency. Mm -hmm. so. Very briefly, uh, we are overstepping the, uh, over <laughs> the schedule. Thank you. We just asked the station for exertion of Paris. I also had a question on the German security strategy. <laughs> And uh, the question is, what is the purpose of the strategy? Is it a plan? Is it a PR? Or is it the result of uh, some internal political struggle within the knowledge? This is a question for the lady here, because she will make it in one minute. <laughs> <laughs> we suck at PR. We could not invent a strategy just to be good at PR. So that's a no for that one, in my humble opinion. <laughs> um, the strategy has been said to be for the international population more than for the German one. To be honest, it's it's vague and you can criticize it, but at least we're starting somewhere. And the German Strategiefähigkeit, the capacity to be able to, to, to strategically look into something is something to really be, be rebuilt. Thank you very much. So we've learned we have a problem with Ukraine studies. We have a problem with project uh, um, projection of power in, on the side of Germany. We have learned there is still a lot to do in the Czech Republic. And we have also learned that we haven't won the info war yet. Have a pleasant day. <laughs> <laughs>